Blade Runner 2, 1049, is a decades after the fact sequel. Duh, right? But in spite of everything, there still aren't that many of them. And the few we have used to be held up as examples of why sequels suck in general, before the dawning of the age of the never-ending franchise. Most sequels shoot for that two to four years out from the initial release sweet spot. If you wait a half decade, a full decade, or, God's help us, three, people start to get a little antsy. Clouds of desperation tend to hang over such productions, leaving even the most enthusiastic fan understandably wary. My generation, and the one immediately before me, tends to hold up Godfather 3 as the Ur example of a decades-after-the-fact sequel that should not have been. But time has gifted us with plenty of others. Some are obvious cash grabs. Attempts to turn big names into name brands. Like Blues Brothers 2000, Tron Legacy, and my personal favorite, Psychos 2, 3, and 4. Others are the movie equivalent of a once chart-topping band's failed reunion tour, like Kingdom of the Crystal Skull or Money Never Sleeps. Then you have the follow-ups to films that were quite self-contained, thank you very much. Attempts to subsist on the scraps of stories that ate the whole plate. Like The Rage Carry 2, or Terminator 3, No Salvation and Genesis. And then there's whatever the fuck Superman Returns was. The remake disguised as a sequel. Thank God nobody talks about that anymore. Actually, thanks Zack. Thanks Zack. But for every one of these, there's a return to Oz. Or a ghost in the shell innocence. Hell, I'm a Godzilla fan. And the movie that got me into Godzilla fandom was a three decades after the fact direct sequel to 1954's original that wiped the intervening 14 movies completely out of existence. The point is, we have to take each of these in turn and fight the urge to dismiss them with some knee-jerk reactionary bullshit. Otherwise, we really will become what we hate. And I'm speaking to my younger self here as much as anybody. Hey! Me, of 2015. Yeah? Put down that Force Awakens review and step away. But, the expanded universe. Nobody cares, dude. And if you put that out now, they're just gonna lump you in with all those assholes calling Rey a Mary Sue. Like they ain't never watched a Twilight movie. God damn it, you're probably right. Is that just gonna become another one of those phrases that gets overused until it loses all its meaning? Dude, what country do we live in? I mean, seriously. Yeah, fair enough. <sighs> so more Bloodborne? Fuck yeah, more Bloodborne. And hey, guess what? Blade Runner 2? Actually good. I don't believe you. I know. I didn't believe it either. But I'm telling you, man. So what about Justice League? Um, sorry, gotta go. Shouldn't know too much about your own future. Bye. Anyway, glory be, Blade Runner, the next generation, is actually the good kind of sequel. The kind that expands upon the premise, setting, and themes of the original without shamelessly recycling all of its story beats. Ridley. We do get another introductory crawl we don't really need, but whatever. It's nice to know the Terrell Corp went bankrupt after the old man got his head caved in. A double dose of poetic justice. And it's nice to know a massive environmental collapse is responsible for all the shitty weather we're going to see throughout the movie. Nuclear winter isn't as de rigueur an explanation as it was back in 1982, no matter how much some of us might like it to be. But life goes on, and there's always going to be some asshole willing to get into the slavery business. Which means there will always be slaves who run, and other assholes willing to hunt them down. This time, though, not only is our titular Blade Runner, 
Officer KD-6-37, explicitly a replicant from the jump, but his struggle with his own second-class citizenship and his position enforcing that is the explicit dramatic backbone of this entire story. When his first victim explicitly calls him out for killing his own kind, Officer K feeds him a justification older than Uncle Tom's cabin. My kind doesn't run. Only older models do. And we, the audience, immediately go, Yeah, right, whatever, smart guy. Your boss is Claire Underwood. I'd have run as soon as I found that out myself. Run, runner. Oh, wait. Nobody remembers Logan's run anymore. Shit, that joke's almost 20 years old at this point, too. Mm. But it takes Kay a little more than that, or otherwise we wouldn't have a movie. He has to find a box of bones in his first victim's yard. The bones of a pregnant woman, with a serial number carved into her hip. The idea of a pregnant replicant, a replicant with the ability to replicate, immediately freaks everyone right the fuck out, and rightly so. As Lieutenant Antiope puts it, if either side of the great divide in this world's social caste system were to find out that they were more alike than different, a war would be inevitable, consuming what little is left of this benighted earth where it snows in Los Angeles. Ugh. So Kay is charged with tracking this child down. The child of an old Nexus model named Rachel, and an ex-Blade Runner named Rick Deckard. Both disappeared 30 years before our story opens, and Kay's investigation takes him from the slums of greater L.A. to the giant garbage dump that used to be San Diego, and the radioactive wasteland that I'm pretty sure is Las Vegas. As the clues mount, Kay comes to believe that he may in fact be the child to us that was born. Or not. Part of what makes this movie so good is that ultimately, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is, this movie's myriad plot twists pay more homage to Philip K. Dick than anything Ridley Scott's done since Blade Runner. The complete lack of assurance in your own experiences, in a world where memories are manufactured on the daily, is as Dickian a theme as they come. The fact he didn't live long enough to see our current generation of rich assholes was no barrier against him creating several characters very much like Neander Wallace. And if you actually bother reading Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, you're going to find replicants that are much more like Wallace's number one girl, Love. Of course her name is Love. Than they are like Rachel, or Pris, or our boy Roy, or even Kay himself. That's always been the fundamental disconnect between source and adaptation. Dick figured, okay, replicants, they look human, but they can't really feel things the way humans do, and they have no particular regard for our lives. They're basically Nazis. Ridley Scott looked at that and countered with, if anybody's the Nazi in this equation, it's the motherfuckers creating whole new races of expendable people and whole new kinds of cops to track them down if they run. Now we find that old Tyrell was burning serial numbers into people's fucking bones. New Tyrell burns them under the back of people's fucking eyeballs, eliminating the need for any series of esoteric questions. You're walking through the woods. There's no one around, and your phone is dead. But out of the corner of your eye, you spot him. Shia LaBeouf. Also, I love Kay's debriefings. Bullshit psych jobs disguised as psych evaluations, complete with the kind of call-and-response shit usually reserved for brainwashing sessions in cults, and a little alarm on his boss's computer that rings whenever his results are off baseline. My kind don't run. Yeah, no shit, genius. You're surveilled to within an inch of your miserable excuse for a life. And the slave state you work for provides you with all the material amenities it considers to be really important. All of them Wallace-branded products, by what I'm sure is just an absurd coincidence. Deckard's shitty apartment looked like a bit of the Nostromo, thrown backwards through time and space. Kay's looks like a goddamn Ikea catalog, complete with his own holographic girlfriend named Joy, 
Of course she's named Joy. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if Wallace is a team of mercenaries on standby with names like Sorrow and Fear and Pain, but like, with a Y. The closest thing Deckard had to a holographic girlfriend was booze. But Joy's existence is important here, because it parallels the replicants in general. Mass-produced product though she may be, she's very much self-aware, and her interactions with Kay have obviously turned her into an individual being. So when he gets her a mobile emitter for their anniversary, they don't call it a mobile emitter, that's Star Trek's term, but really... The first thing they do is go up to the roof and recreate that scene from V for Vendetta with Joy in place of Natalie. Yes, God is in the rain, motherfuckers. Not stuck in some tower he's done up for maximum feng shui. It's too much to hope that a revolution might pull them down out of the towers they built for themselves with other people's labor. One of the things I always... liked is the wrong word appreciated about Tyrell was that while he's chilling on top of his pyramid, everybody else who helped him design and build the Nexus series is either punching a clock in some street level storefront or chilling in some abandoned noir apartment building that Team Roy could just walk right into. Kay's investigation doesn't take him to any place like that, but it does eventually force him to hook up with the revolution. And it's nice to see revolutionary consciousness is growing amongst the replicants. Even if it is, as movie revolutions tend to be, terribly bourgeois. I'd like to see them make their pitch to someone who isn't on his own personal road to Damascus. And who doesn't have a potential, personal, probably familial connection to the world-shaping events unfolding in this plot. Reminds me of another Star Wars movie. Gareth Edwards' Rogue One. If Rogue One were crossed with, I don't know, Passion of the Robo-Christ? Oh wait, that's Robocop. Who may be getting his own Decades After the Fact sequel, though there have been rumors of that since the remake flopped, so I'll believe it when I see it. Nothing's perfect, though. And I did notice a disturbing number of callbacks to previous scenes within this story. As if we, the audience, are too dumb or too easily distracted to remember what happened 30 minutes ago in the movie we're presumably watching. I guess that's a sign of how far the world's moved on since 1982. As is the fact Ridley Scott didn't direct this. Only executive produced it. And that can mean a lot of things. Some XPs hover like helicopter parents. Others cash their checks and go make alien prequels. Either way, actual directing duties fell to Denis Villeneuve, the guy who did Arrival, and a bunch of other stuff I haven't seen but want to now that I've seen this. Dude made an actually good Blade Runner sequel. Boss, that's gotta be tough enough. <laughs> Usually, decades after the fact, sequels are proving grounds for complete unknowns, but... This guy's got two decades worth of movies on his resume. And he's friends with no less of a cinematographer than Roger Deakins. The guy who made all the Coen Brothers movies look so good. He's in full effect here as well. Blade Runner's world was always beautiful. But it was a depressing, ugly kind of beautiful. Yet, with their powers combined, our director and cinematographer have managed to do something that I previously thought impossible. And make it just... Straight up beautiful, beautiful. Still, it was never going to be anything other than a singular protagonist's journey through the by now standard Campbellian hero's arc, right up to, and including, reconciliation with the father. I accept that, and I think a lot of people accepted it, despite their frequent and loudly announced hatred of just this kind of story. Because, unlike so many, it followed through on the promise of the original Blade Runner. Just like last time, it doesn't ultimately matter if Deckard is Kay's bio-dad or not. From a spiritual perspective, he is Kay's father. And by the end, they do connect. One Blade Runner to another. Two generations of compromised agents of a corrupt system, united in their rebellion against it. 
And I was going to end this with some naive hope that everyone involved would have the good sense slash guts to leave things where they are. But hope is a wish for an outcome over which you have no agency. And none of us have agency in the movie business, even the people who work in it. They are all slave to numbers. And according to standard Hollywood math, Blade Runner 2049 flopped. Yes, you can make $260 million and still flop. Because $260 million minus the $180 million budget only gets you $80 million of profit. And theaters get to keep half the ticket price, so that's more like $40 million, which probably didn't even cover the ad budget. So it looks like Blade Runner is going to become a once-in-a-generation type of thing. And you know what? I'm okay with that. Trying to turn it into its own expanded universe would only create all sorts of new problems. Speaking of which... There's something you've been putting off for far too long. Yes. Yeah. You're right. And special thanks to an anonymous benefactor. If you would also like to give me money, but have a few qualms about your name appearing on something that might, uh, I don't know, attract the ire of pissed off internet movie nerds then please by all means don't hesitate let me know through the patreon i'll hook you up no problem i'll add like a multiplier to the anonymous benefactor credit or something and you'll start with an a so you'll all always be near the top if not the top next time lord help us we're back on our bullshit